Hi, my name is Jane Hampton Cook and I'm the author of American Phoenix and I am so glad that you've asked me to share about my book for your book club and that you chose American Phoenix for your book club selection. Well, what I want to do today is answer your questions about American Phoenix. One question that I know you have is how did I research American Phoenix? What I did is I looked, through the, I looked through the diaries of both John Quincy and Louisa Adams. John Quincy Adams had 600 diary pages, typeset, not handwritten, that was after they typeset it. He had 600 diary pages from 1809 to um, 1814 in this, in this time period of the book. He also had many letters that he wrote and there are collections of his letters in printed books. There's also collections of his letters in the handwritten form at the Library of Congress. Uh, and Louisa also kept a diary, not quite as extensive, but she had a diary and she also wrote a journal, an account, a narrative of her journey from St. Petersburg to Paris in 1815. And thanks to the Massachusetts Historical Society, they sent me her typewritten version of her diary that they had been working on uh, before they published it. And I was thrilled to be able to work from an electronic version of her diary. It was very, very helpful. But I did transcribe many handwritten letters to and from John Quincy and Louisa, uh, to and from Abigail Adams, who was John Quincy's mother, and John Adams, the second president, who was John Quincy Adams' father. So I did do some of that type of work as well. I also did, you know, some basic research on um, different battles that they talked about in their diaries or different things that were related to the, to the overarching history of America, the War of 1812, or Napoleon's invasion of Russia, uh, those types of things. I did do um, library research basically on, on a lot of topics related to the book. Now, another question I know you have is how did I develop the story? How did I develop the characters? What I did is when I read through those diaries, I looked for conflict. Where there's conflict, there is a story. And so I looked at those places throughout this time period of, of where they both mentioned conflict and how they felt about that conflict and what they did to solve it. And, or maybe they couldn't solve the conflict. I just looked for those places, and especially those places where they conveyed emotion, where they were sad, where they were happy, where they were frustrated, where they were angry, and I hooked into those moments to help drive the plots of the story. Everything that is in quotation marks in the book was something that they wrote. And because there was so much to draw from in their writings, the book has a tendency to flow like conversation, which is the way I, I was hoping it would flow, to make it easy to read in that way. Uh, the characterization, some of it is my interpretation, but I really did try. If, if Louisa expressed a certain feeling about a certain topic, I really tried to bring that out as well in my interpretation of how things unfolded for them because this this is a nonfiction book um, literary nonfiction is a lot of times what it's called now another question I know you have is why did I choose this time period the time period of the of the war of 1812 well, one reason I chose it is that the 200th anniversary is coming up this year in 1814, 200 years, 2014. But also, that's not a chapter of the, in our nation's history that a lot of people know about. I really thought it was a good opportunity to shed light on a very pivotal part of our history. Um, and the geopolitical dynamics of where we were as a country 200 years ago is pretty fascinating. You know, we proudly called ourselves Americans, but people in Europe, they called us Britons. Napoleon, eh, if a ship came from America, it was just the same as if it came from England. England, ah, they couldn't defeat us militarily. They were going to try to defeat us economically by suppressing our ability to trade with foreign countries. That's the circumstances that we found ourselves in. You know, we think of ourselves as a superpower today. 
Back then, the United States of America was barely a power at all. And so it was hugely pivotal that we emerge as a strong and independent country, not just in name only, but in the way the world recognized and accepted us. Uh, another question that I sometimes get is, um, why American Phoenix? Why did you choose that name? Well, Phoenix, from your memory of mythology, Phoenix was the bird. It's actually shaped a lot like an eagle, which I thought was fascinating to read about. And this Phoenix dies on the funeral pyre and then he soars to new life and greater heights. It's a symbol of rebirth. And one reason why I chose this time period in John Quincy and Louisa Adams' life is that it is a time of rebirth for them. Um, John Quincy Adams in 1808, he is down on his luck. How many of us know someone who's been down on their luck, who's lost a job or lost a dream? Well, that's what makes this story so relatable. That's what happened to John Quincy Adams. He'd been in the U.S. Senate. He took an unpopular vote and voted with Thomas Jefferson, the president, an opposite political party from the Adamses, but he stood on principle and it cost him politically. The men in Boston hated the fact that he voted for the Embargo Act and they decided not to even put his name on the ballot in 1808. So he resigned. He was just down on his luck. He went back to teaching, he opened his law practice, but he never thought he'd serve the public again. He was very doubtful and very depressed and, and down on, on things. But then, in 1809, there's a new president in town, James Madison. Madison appoints John Quincy Adams as minister plenipotentiary to this court of St. Petersburg, Russia. And all of John Quincy's enemies, his political enemies, are thrilled to get him out of the country his friends recognize that it's an honorable opportunity, but it's nonetheless a little bit like going into exile because it took 80 days by boat to, um, to get to St. Petersburg from Boston. John Quincy is, you know, he's accepting that this is his lot in life, but it's an opportunity to serve. It's not what he wanted, but it is a chance. And then um, Louisa is told by her father-in-law that she's going to go to Russia, but their oldest two children, her John Quincy and Louisa's two oldest sons, ages eight and six, are going to stay behind in Boston to be educated. Um, she doesn't have any say in this decision. She is devastated. Ambition can never repay such sacrifice, she wrote. But John Adams, the the former president really was worried that if the entire family of John Quincy Adams went on this boat, and if there was a shipwreck, then they, he could lose all of them. And he, so in order to preserve the family line, John Adams decided to separate John Quincy and Louisa from their older children. So Louisa starts the story as you know, having very little decision-making say in her life about her most intimate relationships with her children. They go to Russia. They are hugely successful. They have a lot of conflict, a lot of drama but that they encounter, but ultimately they're very successful. Um, the emperor takes a liking to Louisa. Um, he agrees to trade with America. He um, offers to intervene in our war against England in 1812. The Brits, they don't like that offer. They don't want Russia to mediate a peace treaty, but they agree to go to the peace table directly with America. John Quincy Adams is part of that negotiation process. Um, and the Prime Minister of England secretly writes that the Tsar of Russia has become half an American in his thinking. And that is because of John Quincy Adams. You would never hear someone say, that the current leader of Russia is half an American in his thinking. So we've come quite a long distance actually from where we started in our relationship with Russia officially. And then Louisa. Louisa goes through all of these difficulties while she's in St. Petersburg and John Quincy recognizes what a tremendous um, partner and asset she is to him as a political wife. And he entrusts her at the end of the book to travel by herself, meaning without a male protector, from 
St. Petersburg over 40 days, a thousand plus miles to Paris to meet up with him after the Treaty of Ghent has been signed. And then hopefully they can be reunited with their children. And her hope of being reunited is what drives her to make the, the best decisions she can. So the woman who's not allowed to weigh in on the most important decision with her children's welfare, six years later is entrusted to make life and death decisions to travel uh, from St. Petersburg to Paris. And that is why this is called American Phoenix. Both John Quincy and Louisa rise from the ashes of life and soar to greater heights. He goes from down on his luck to now being on path to become Secretary of State and President of the United States. She goes from being a mother without any power and decision-making authority into a woman entrusted to make some really difficult decisions, and she does an amazing job at it. And likewise, America as a country is a phoenix. We rise from the ashes of the War of 1812 into a country that is widely recognized as an independent country. We never go to war with England again, and we enter the era of good feeling, as it's called in, in American history. So this was just such an, a, a pivotal turning point that it was a story I thought really needed to be told. So that's a little bit about um, how I came to write it. I, I also, it took me probably four years from the time I started working on it until I, until I had a publisher in hand to get the book into print. Um, and I, what I, my habit was just simply, I took my older kids at the time to preschool when they were preschoolers and I'd go write for a few hours at Starbucks, pick up my children and then spend the afternoon with them. So that's, that was sort of my workflow um, and, and why it took a little while to, to put it all together. So again, thank you. Um, I appreciate your time and thank you for reading the book. Please tell others about the book. Um, if you like to write reviews, feel free to do that on Amazon or barnesandnoble.com. And also in September, it's the 200th anniversary of the Star Spangled Banner. And I have a little book coming out and it's a short gift style book. It's about 64 pages called America's Star Spangled Story. It's already available on Amazon to pre-order it. Uh, it's about Francis Scott Key. I took the phrase phrases from the Star Spangled Banner and I wrote an essay about each one from that first verse to bring that story to life in hopefully a fresh way and hopefully a way that will help people relive um, the story behind our national anthem. So again, thank you.